Vanderhill interviewing Dr. Thomas Kuntz, Emeritus Professor of English, October 27, 2004, for the Ball State History Project. Tom, I'd like to begin uh, by, of course, thanking you for agreeing to help me with my study, but I'd like you to tell me some about your educational background. Uh, where you're from, where you got your degrees. Kind of take me up to Tom Coons at about the point when Tom Coons decides to accept an offer from Ball State. Ah, okay. Um, well, I'm a native Hoosier. I grew up in Fort Wayne, um, a few or, or a year or so in uh, the Texas Panhandle during the Second World War, and then and then back here for school through high school. I went out of state just across the border to Miami of Ohio for my undergraduate years, and then came back into Indiana for my master's and doctorate at IU Bloomington. And um, then wanted to get away and was lucky enough to get a, get a job at George Washington University. Um, spent two glorious years there. I loved the place, loved the city, loved the school, loved the students, et cetera, et cetera. Um, lost a child. Uh, Fled back to Indiana. But Ball, so Ball State. So now we get to Ball State. Okay. So we're talking May of when was that? May of '67. Ball State is hiring like crazy. I, I get in, I get into the job market in May of '67. Um, had a couple pla other places I could have gone, but mainly wanted to get back to Indiana because you know of the grief, et cetera, and, and, and um, family here in Indiana. And that year, Ball State is hiring 15. 15 associate professors in, um, in English and um, assistant professors. Assi uh, thank you very much. Let's not promote <laughs> Everybody's getting promoted here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A little wistful thinking. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, assistant professors. And um, Andreas Boulakidis and I interviewed at exactly the same time. And um, because I was more desperate, I accepted the offer before he did. So I got slot number 14, and he got number 15. <laughs> And um, came here thinking, frankly, that, that we'd be here for a couple of years to recover and, and maybe go back to, uh, to the East Coast or something. But, uh, but of course, it didn't work out that way. <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> what, what were your expectations of the role of a faculty member when you joined the Department of English? Um, you know, I, you have to realize that, that I was not thinking. I was I was crazy during that first year, um, and and I think an interesting thing is that my senior colleagues knew nothing about that, so I think they just saw me as a guy who was just crazy. Um, I didn't realize how crazy I was at the time. Looking back, I could see that I, I was just trying basically to to get my family in a position in which we could could survive emotionally right. and financially. Um, I sort of thought that Ball State would be much like George Washington, and, and of course it just wasn't. Um, or much like IU, where I had taught as a, as a grad student, and, and it wasn't. But, but several of the people who came here, in, came into English in 67 and became good friends of mine, um, were AB, I was ABD at that time. Um, they were ABD. <coughs> I thought I was going to finish my dissertation, get my doctorate, et cetera, which I did. They didn't. They had already decided that they were terminal ABD, and they were told by the department chair when they interviewed, and, and they told me this, and, and, and I, I have no reason to think that this wasn't true. They were told there will always be a place at Ball State for the, for the ABD, as long as you teach well. You will not need to get your, your doctorate. You will not need to publish. Teach well. If you're going to get tenure. You're going to get and of course, that turned out. You know, I I, I don't know that uh, to, to, to what extent the department chair might have been misrepresenting. Maybe not at all. I think maybe he thought that's the way it would be. But of course, it, it, it very soon began to change, and, and, and they're all gone. Um, so my expectations, I think, were simply that it would give me a place to teach well, which I was very much interested in doing. And uh, I, I did go to the library uh, on the day I interviewed and found that uh, Ball State had surprisingly very strong holdings in, in my area with uh, modernist American poetry. I expected to do research in that area. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to do some research, get, 
did some publications, teach well, enjoy the teaching, and, and go somewhere. But there wasn't any expectation on the part of your chair or even your senior colleagues that you would have to engage in what later came to be called <coughs> scholarly productivity. Absolutely not. Okay. Uh, my senior colleagues, many of my senior colleagues, um, never published ever in their careers, um, or maybe published a very minor you know, notes and queries or something like that. Um, there had been a revolt in the English department, which was part of, part of the reason they were hiring so many people. Uh, there had been a revolt, a revolt against the chair, and the rebels had lost, and, uh, and the jock chair had had told a number of people that they would never get tenure, and, and therefore they left. And some of them went on to, to do some publishing, I know. There were a couple of people on the side of the chair who stayed who considered research to be a very important part of their professionalism, and, and they did uh, over the years that do some publishing. Well, was the chair at that time Tom Whitmore? Yeah. How, how long was he here when you came, or after you came? Not very long. Um, the revolt continued, led by one of the, of the tenured senior faculty members. Um, and in fact, in the spring of my freshman year here, and my office was right next to hers, oh. and um, in the spring, she put together a petition to the president of the university to remove Tom Webhart. And she came to me and said, you will sign this petition. So I had to decide here, you know, yeah. um, do I side with Wetmore? Is he going to win? Or do I side with, with yeah. his colleague? And, and is she going to win? And um, I decided she was going to win. And in fact, she did. I signed but, the petition. But Wetmore left shortly so after that. So he left uh, shortly uh, after that. Yeah, I, I can't remember whether he was yeah. here one more year, two more years. Where did he go? Wright State? You know, uh, Wright, which, was, which, which, well, at that time, it was a branch of Miami. But was, was he succeeded by Dick Renner? Am I, am I missing yes, something here? Okay. Right, no. So we we hired from the outside. Right, right. I think of that because Dick had been, among other things, an honors dean at the University yes. of Missouri and was a very important mentor to me. When all of a sudden yes. I found myself as a fairly young assistant professor running the honors program here. So I always have right. a, a kind spot in my heart for Dick Renner and the role that he played. I think he was kind of a, what you say, a healer? in terms of the department? Yes. Yeah, he had to be. And, and fortunately, he had the, the, uh, the personality and, yeah. and, and uh, right. you know, to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and sufficient status, you know, to, to, to be sufficiently impressive. Um, <laughs> and he smoked a pipe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he was in English literature. At yeah. that time, in English department, um, as, as in English departments all over the United States, the general consideration was that English literature was highly valuable, and American literature was sort of silly. Okay. And um, oh. in, in order to have any status in an English department, I think anywhere in the United States you had to have, you had to have, have done um, your concentration in, in English literature, which I had not. I was right. in American yeah, literature. Right. Um, and so, for instance, when it came to putting people up for tenure and promotion. Um, the department was dominated by the British Literature faculty. The Tenure and Promotion Committee was always dominated by the British Literature faculty. And the British Literature uh, faculty members who were up for tenure or, or for promotion were always put on the list automatically ahead of the American Literature faculty. I didn't know that. They, they were, yeah, they were simply grouped that way. Oh, yeah. And then you, you had yeah. to move up, move up the line. I guess I got into this, so, oh, probably beginning with Dick and then on into his successor with uh, the approach that uh, Daryl Adrian used to give people at least one, what he called, goody course a year, and the humanities course of the honors program, oh, later honors college, was one of those goodies. Yeah. But I do recall people in the British Literature Committee certainly seemed to have first shot at getting yes. honors humanities courses. Right, that, that was the politics of that moment. But it was an intellectual politics, yeah. be, be, because those people really believed that um, if, if, you, if your concentration was in English literature, then you would be intelligent and knowledgeable enough to handle, for instance, continental literature or classical literature. Yeah. Well, go all the way to the end then, and, and 
tell me as you reflect back on a long and distinguished career here, why did you stay? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I probably haven't analyzed myself enough to know for sure. Um, I, I, I had gotten uh, a good increase in salary. George Washington University at that time um, paid immorally low salaries because they could take advantage of the fact that they could hire lots of people cheap because of their, their location. Um, so, so we found ourselves living now in, in a house with, which we were buying right. um, instead of a, a, an apartment uh, with no commute. I had had a commute in, in, in D.C. of anywhere from an hour to three hours, depending on what time I could, could get away, um, uh, and, and with a much better salary. And also, as a part of the healing process, Everyone advised that we have another child immediately. Um, and, and okay, we were, we were open to that. And um, so we had another child immediately. Um, another girl, so I was a third girl. We lost a boy. No, Ren was the first, oh, and, then, okay. uh, and then Kenya. Yeah. And Soren, the boy we had lost. And then Hyde, and then everybody know we got another girl. And, and, um, and people are saying, Try again, try again. <laughs> so we tried again. So you know, so we were so wrapped up in that, plus being crazy anyway. And we had another girl, another girl, of course, yeah, Nicole. And, and of course, the four of them are great people. Yeah, right. you know, I mean, you know, I've gotten over that whole thing. And they're great people and doing well, and et cetera, et cetera. And I've got three grandsons. <laughs> so you know, so at any rate, but but I mean, so you know, so I didn't I didn't make that kind of move for quite a few years there. Then. And this is this is just an idiosyncratic thing. This doesn't represent the university at all. But 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 for myself, I had been uh, a poet in high school and uh, an undergrad in college at Miami. Went into a scholarly program at IU. You know, highly trained, et cetera, et cetera. Totally believed that I should do scholarship. It took me some years to realize you're you're not a literary scholar. You're a poet. So so I didn't I didn't put together the credentials early on that would make it possible to make a, leave, to make a move either. Um, and then start publishing poetry. And over the years, I've done OK in poetry, et cetera. But, but at that moment, when, when I might have wanted to, to, to move, I probably couldn't have. And the job market was tightened up. You know, so that, 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 yeah. those are probably the two scholarly well, it, and personal reasons. Is it fair to say that you also, uh, because of your work in creative writing, both on and off campus and other opportunities that came your way that, like a lot of your colleagues, my colleagues I've interviewed for this project, that they simply found this was a good place to do what they wanted to oh, do. Oh, yeah, right. So it's all coming back to me now. <laughs> <laughs> well, and of course, I had to finish my right. doctorate. Right. And, and in my emotional condition, that was really hard to do. Yeah. But, but I managed to do that. And, um, and by then, I really was enjoying the teaching here right. so much. And then the Carmichael. Thing, which I was offered an opportunity to go and just went into that. Yeah, so it was a good life. Okay, sure. Full of interesting opportunities. Now, notice I haven't said anything <laughs> up to this point about the fact that I'd like you to reflect a little bit then about a real change in the pattern of your life, and that is when you became department chair. Oh, yeah, uh, that's I mean, later. You know, you had an opportunity that a lot of our colleagues did not have of being an administrator, and I often yeah. have said that the chair of a department, especially size of the English department here is the most difficult job on this campus. I just want you to reflect a, a little bit on, yeah. It's it's a, 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 how was that? It ruined my, it ruined <laughs> my gastrointestinal, <laughs> or whatever that's called, <laughs> system. GI. I'm on Pryo, uh, yeah, I'm on Pryo set every day <laughs> now for the rest of my life. Oh, oh. Um, yeah, it was a very interesting experience. And, 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 and um, because of the politics and so on of, of the English department over the years, up until that time, I had been very much in and out of the department. Right. I was essentially out of the department to Car Carmichael. Then, even when I came back into the to the uh, the building with with everybody else, yeah. the the politics and so on was such that that often I would tend to think of myself as in sort of semi retirement. Right. I mean, I I would take take advantage of the schedule and say I spent a lot of time working at home. Mm -hmm. So 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 that when the time came, that people asked me to run for chair. That was a, 
a lot of people were, were aghast. I mean, they just would not have thought of me as. I was surprised you did it. I'll tell yeah. you that right now. Okay. Yeah, they wouldn't have thought I was interested. Although, in the several years preceding that, I had been on salary committee, promotion and candidate committee, etc. I mean, so I was, by that time, I was back in the department. Yeah. And, 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 and we had the boyerization going yeah. on, and I had been was one of the leaders of trying to get that accomplished, etc. So, I mean, so it wasn't, yeah. wasn't really right out of the blue. Um, yeah, so I think really I was, I served my three-year term at exactly the right time for my personality okay. and, uh, and a good time in the department. Um, but as, as you know, um, I, I ended up really spending the last year and a half, the last half of my term in office, I ended up, it, it was consumed by the problem of the, the tenure line. Right. It, remember that we could that we fired. Yeah. Um, and that, that's what did it for my stomach. <laughs> so right. I mean, that's that's why. That, yeah, I mean, that, and that's fairly atypical. I mean, yeah, most that chairs atypical. don't have to endure that because no. most chairs aren't willing to take on that that well, fight. Uh, yeah. But I think for the betterment of the department, you decide you want to do it, you and your colleagues. But yeah. uh, it, it certainly, I suppose, as you reflect back on this, doesn't make your time as chair a highlight of your career here. But I, I certainly could have done more for the department during that last year and a half if I had not been consumed by that stuff. But it was, but what, oh, yeah, okay, certainly uh, it, it, it was, it was a, an interesting experience to have had in one's career. You know, it, it, it certainly made, made the career a different thing than it would have been if I had never been involved in administration at that point. Same thing I told my colleague Bruce Gilbert when he found himself in the position of he will either be the chair of history starting this current semester or they didn't know what they were going to do. And so he's over there now as department head and uh, you know, trying to swim upstream as best he can. The mass of paper that keeps coming downstream <laughs> when yeah, you're at department oh, head it's just, it's it's just has only gotten amazing. worse. Just it, it, in what ways do you feel that Ball State changed? Well, it changed a lot. So, okay. You know, I, where? Well, I, I think you've already you've already mentioned the, the, certainly one of the major ways of change, and that is the the the, the constantly changing um, expectations of, of the faculty yeah. um, to be more and more productive, and, and that took place all over the country. I, right. I, I take it that's my impression. Yeah, it's, I think I it's especially schools like our like Ball State, right. and emerging universities, yeah. as they used to be called. Maybe a little later here than some. But yeah, yeah, surely. Um, but but it but it did happen, and I think is uh, at least in the English department, it's, it's still going. And and um, so of course that produced a, a lot of uh, frustration and bitterness and so on. That people who couldn't um, adjust to those changes well. Um, but, but it's been very exciting for people who could adjust. And the, the change in the reward system, um, I, in English at least, did mean that productivity came to be rewarded. Okay. So I, I think that was a really good thing. Um, and furthermore, in terms of hiring, in English, um, we've, we've been able to hire really fine people, uh, partly because of the job market. Um, but because we could say, okay, you know, we, yeah. y yes, we are going to value your research, et cetera, but we're going to value, but basically English says, you're going to have to teach well. We're not going to tenure you, and we're not going to promote you if you don't teach well. But by the way, you're also going to have to, going to, have to be productive as a research scholar. We don't tell them about the service, but this is really going to eat them up. <laughs> but, you know, and, and, and we, will, we will recognize that. We will, we will reward that. So in English, in the time that, that I was in the department, went from um, a, a, a faculty that included some very good teachers and a large, in my opinion, a large number of very poor teachers, went from that to a department that includes a, a high percentage of very good teachers and very good research scholars. The problem for English is keeping those people, yeah. right. and, that because of, and that's because of salaries, yeah. of course. Right. 
the reward system really has not, in my opinion, kept up with the, the expectations. Well, I think you're in a position now where a lot of these people come here and they do produce good scholarly work, which gives them more opportunities uh, to go elsewhere. Yeah, exactly. uh, and a lot of our colleagues didn't do that for whatever reason. And so they found themselves in, in mid-career uh, looking in the mirror and saying, well, gee, I might like to go to Michigan State, but Michigan State's not going to call. Uh, and exactly. So they were here. Uh, and some people adjusted well to the fact they were going to stay here until they retired, and some did not. Th think of a little bit what I call structural changes. We made a major change on the calendar from quarters to semesters. Oh, yeah, I forgot about uh, that. Did that. Did that have any impact on you at all? Uh, yeah. I, um, I was very much in favor of going to the semester system. And um, of course, I had taught under the semester system. Right. All, all my previous teaching and all my previous studies as a student had been under the semester system. It made sense to me. I knew it would work. But for all of some of my colleagues didn't think so. But um, but the main thing is, it seemed to me, and I still think it's the case, that under this, that in English you need a lot of time to read and to talk about the, the literature that's being read. Um, and it seemed to me that the semester system allowed for that to happen. There's a, a different pace in your studies. So you could make different um, assignments in, in, say, a novel, for instance. You, you could assign a larger part of the novel or even an entire short novel for the next class meeting, you know, and, and there would be time to read that and, and then more time to talk about it, too. So, so uh, I think especially, of course, English is, is not only literature, English and linguistics, but um, I think for people teaching literature, especially the change of semester, is a very good thing. Okay. Let me try another angle on that, though. Uh, one of the things that concerned me as provost was that under the quarter system, and the way we set up the quarter system with float hours, as you recall, mm -hmm. people pretty much had to be around the campus, the department, almost every day. Right. By going to semesters, we created faculty. Mm -hmm. When we created faculty, I began to call Tuesday, Thursday faculty, and Monday, Wednesday, Friday faculty. Now, that may have been a good thing when you were on the faculty. I thought it was a good thing the last couple of years when I was on the faculty before I retired. But we did that, and I can recall saying to John Worthen, you need to know you're going to change the way the faculty see their lives in terms of being around their department or just being on campus, because now they can simply stay away from here if they want to on Tuesday, Thursday, or if they had Tuesday, Thursday schedule, stay away on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, which, as you well know, some people did. Me? <laughs> well, that's why I, I asked. Know, for a period yeah, of time, yeah, that's right. I, I could not stand to be uh, in the building yeah, yeah. with with a number of my senior colleagues, yeah. you know, until the time finally came that, that they had all retired. Okay. So I just stayed away. So it was a good thing for you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but also it was a good thing, I think, in terms of being able to work, um, okay. you know, to to write. Right. To, to do yeah. the the reading, but especially yeah. if you're going to do the writing, and I think this is true of, of my of my a research scholar uh, colleagues as well. Right. It allows you to put together a block of time in which, and it's the same with with uh, with Nina and Art. Sure. You know, you've got to be able to get in the studio and have uninterrupted yeah. large blocks of time. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly felt that way as a historian. I you. I mean, unlike some colleagues, I needed big blocks of time to get my work done, and a big block of time to be. And so you could go into the source materials you were using early in the morning and stay as long as you want to at night, rather than do these what I call snippets under the quarter system where you might be in the library for a couple of hours. I just couldn't get stuff done that way. And so one of the reasons I was so passionately in favor of changing the semesters was exactly that. that I mean, it wasn't so much you could get away from your senior colleagues, although there's something to be said for that. It was more that you could spend a lot of time on task. Yeah, yeah, you could get yeah. work done. A major, a major change in the university from my individual point of view yeah. was that we put together a creative writing program yeah. over a period of years. Right. And, and, and I essentially was in charge of doing that. And one of the things I did was, was to, um, and, and, and partly because I was chair, I, I, could, uh, I had some control of this too. Right. So I put together a schedule in which almost all of the creative writing classes met Tuesdays and Thursdays. 
So on Tuesdays and Thursdays you have this big day in which all the creative writing faculty and all the creative writing majors and minors are all there in the building and it's creative writing, etc. But then that gives faculty and students four-day quotes weekend sure. in which to really get some writing done. That's uh, a good idea. I think it's yeah. important. In, in what ways during your career do you feel Ball State stayed the same? Yeah, salaries, of course. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I just think, I, I, I think that the low salaries have been a, a tremendous problem, disadvantage, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I don't know, I don't know why salaries weren't improved more than they were here. I, I, you know, I was never on the inside enough to know. Maybe it just could not be done for all I know. But I do think that the university would have been, would have been a much better place. If today, today you learn the truth. Yeah. Because um, I, I, at some point, I got to put this on tape anyway. What really happened was that. John Worthen, though I think he was a very successful president in many, many ways, realized that faculty salaries indeed had to be his highest priority, but he wasn't willing to take the horrendous pain that he would have had to have taken from other areas of the university to move large amounts of money into the faculty salary pool. Now what I mean by that is he would have had to have made a major decision to take that money out of other vice presidential areas. And he really wasn't willing to do that for a variety of reasons. And as a result, we began to lag all the time. We had that one year of major howling and protesting when he told everybody they had to get 3% of their budgets back so we could have a 6% increase in the year in which then Governor Bai had approved only a 3% salary increase. But even with that, uh, John took so much heat during that year that I knew he was never going to do that again. And that occurred in the early 90s, of course, even with this president until late. So it, it really comes down to the fact that there was some money there. Maybe it wouldn't have been enough, but it would have been sufficient to at least make a little bit of impact. But the money would have had to have been reallocated from areas in which there would have been a lot of howling and moaning and groaning. And he was wasn't willing yeah. to do that. Well, that that doesn't surprise me at all. I, I didn't know that yeah. for sure. I, I you know I had an idea along those lines, but um, and in fact, the next thing I was going to say was that the university seems to me still to be the same in terms of uh, the, having the, the non-academic areas having too much yeah. power. Yeah. Well, that, I want to get I want to get changed. back. So I want to ask some questions about governance a little bit later, but I. I think that's probably true, and I think that also has to do with the fact that John came out of a student affairs background sure. and really saw the university as one that needed to have equal equal shares almost of people who were in different areas of responsibility. There, there's no question that's true, and I can I can tell you that flat out. And John and I used to have a lot of discussions about. And related to that, another thing I'll mention is it seems to me another way in which the university has not changed, or at least has not changed enough, is that there are still too many people in positions of power in the university, as in the city, who seriously lack imagination. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're retrograde. These are retrograde people, mainly because they just don't have the imagination. Mm -hmm. And and this, I, I, I had a tremendous shock um, as I adjusted to being at Ball State. It was so different from the, the, the whole Washington, D.C. Oh, sure. thing yeah. in, in the mid-60s, and, and GW faculty, although the university was not a great university at that time. GW has much improved since then. But the GW faculty at that time was a tremendously imaginative group of people. And I came here thinking, well, this is the way universities are. Well, <laughs> Do you view the changes that have occurred here during your career as mostly positive or negative, and is there, is there a sort of balance, not trying to put words in your mouth? Oh, I think, no, I think the changes have been, have been positive. Okay. Yeah, I, I feel great about the changes that, that I'm familiar with. Yeah. I just think there, there are some other things that should have changed that didn't. Yeah. So, so when you look at the life of a faculty member now comes to Ball State, uh, and maybe it, the English department is a little bit atypical in this regard, but 
you see the life of the, the new pre-tenure faculty member of the Department of English as being a much more positive one than Tom Coombs as a pre-tenure faculty member in the late 1960s. Yeah, I think so. And, and, and I've been in a position to, to be able to observe the, the younger people, partly because I was so involved in hiring so many of them. And, and um, you know, luckily they invite me to parties, and right. et cetera, et cetera. And I, I, I think that they tend to be a pretty happy group in terms of the university. What they tend not to be happy with is uh, opportunities provided by the, the town. Right. So that single people, for instance, especially single people especially, is very hard to keep them here. Well, they all live in Fishers anyway. Nobody's yeah, filled. yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's one of the, that also, I think, has a lot to do with the change in the calendar. I mean, that's one of the other things I said yeah, to President sure. Morgan. When you change that calendar, you're going to give people more of an opportunity as Indianapolis grows north, as 332 gets constructed, to be in Fishers or Broad Ripple or Noblesville uh, and then come in here a couple days a week. And, yeah. and that's indeed what happened. Well, yeah, Pat Collier, one of the best sure. of the young people. And so he comes with, a, with yeah. a, a wife who is very much professional. She can't get work here. She gets work with state government in Indianapolis. He lives down there. Who are some of the people in your career, either here or elsewhere, who've had a particular impact on you? Well, you obviously. Oh, well, that's kind of the same. I mean, for good or ill. Yeah, no, no, no very positive. I, mean, I thought, you know, just for the record, I'm one who thinks you're a great provost. I, I felt really good when I heard they were going to be provost. I thought, all right. You know. It was um, a fun time. I mean, you're, and you're an imaginative person, so I mean, I think that makes you good. Et cetera. So I mean, I could, I could spend <laughs> five, five minutes praising you, but that, that's not what you asked me. No, no, no. So, um, yeah. And this could be people that are on or off campus, I might yeah, think. Yeah, well, right, because I had colleagues at CW, even in the two years that I was there, who were, you know, partly because of, uh, I was right out of grad school, and et cetera, et cetera, but they were, I still think of them, you know, very, very often. They, they, were, they were sort of models for me as to what a, but older back than I was not Yeah. Um, well, you were involved in the Carmichael project. Was that and, a well, and so particular the highlight group, for you? Well, yeah, yeah that, 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 and, and you were, you, you know, you're part of that. But, yeah, yeah. Right, that, that whole group of, of people, some of whom are like Joe Momoa, who's, yeah, who's, right. who's no longer here, or Joe uh, Tremor, who is still here. Yeah. That, that, that whole group. Yeah, I, I think one of the best things that for me as a, young faculty member here, let's say in the first five to ten years, was that I got to know my peers not only in English but in other departments, in history especially. And and they were they were really a good really a good group of people, good group of friends and a good group of colleagues. Yeah, Carmichael as I look back on it, uh, gets better every year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I, I just saw Vic Wallhead the other day yeah. and I said, you know, as I reflect back on my time here, this is you're not the first person to bring this up on my head. But it was just an opportunity to bring an awful lot of young, <laughs> imaginative people together in the same physical setting to sort of bounce a lot of ideas off each other. Yeah, and, right. and that's pretty unique in an institution of our size. Right. And, and, and who were good teachers and, mm -hmm. and valued good teaching highly. And yep. Sure. Took, took a lot of pride. Yeah. But other people, I'm trying right. to think, okay, who outside Ball State has, has been very important to me? And, and, and those will be mostly poets because. Okay. Um, as I became more and more involved nationally in the scene as a poet, and, and partly because I became an editor also in, in independent press, et cetera, I got to know a lot of poets, and, and you know, Robert Bly, sure. William oh, yeah. Stafford, people like that that I've gotten to know well and have been very important to me. Tell me a little bit about your areas of uh, involvement uh, within the university and in the community. What, what are some of the things terms of this wonderful category that we hear so much about service. Uh, how would you describe Tom Coons in his long distinguished career as a person involved in service? I mean, you mentioned some things about poetry, you mentioned some things about the press and creative writing, but uh, there's some other areas on campus and off campus that you look back on with some pride. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I well, you can't talk about the P and T committee, <laughs> <laughs> or the salary committee, or something yeah. like that. <laughs> no. 
you know i was never involved much in the city i tried at one point in what's been the late seventy's i was involved with a group that tried to put together the delaware county council for the arts to get a local arts council yeah right and that was very disappointing that didn't work out but i had my first taste there of infighting among among people in the arts yeah yeah it turns out there was more competition than cooperation that didn't go well with the result that the jay county where things did go well became sort of a power in the state and right in the arts um but but of course the university is a power in the state in the arts sure so um so i don't i don't recall after carmichael i don't recall ever been involved being involved much in the 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 whole service area of our of our work outside the department until i became chair right and then then i got to know other chairs in the in the college and so on um well there must be something i'm forgetting you know it's just not it's just not coming back well here here's a a bigger issue and i know you feel very strongly about this and that is i'd like you to reflect a little bit on what the role of the faculty has been at ball state during the time you were primarily a member of the faculty did they play what you see as a proper role in the decision making and things like that well you know i've already mentioned it seems to me that the the university the whole time i've been here has has been dominated by non-academic areas um i think that's too bad i think that neither the city nor the university has a culture that values university faculty as highly as they should be i mean i think there are just many many people who have never had the concept of what it is to be an intellectual what it is to be an artist what it is to be a university faculty member as 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 something special in society and in our culture um and and within the university something which which is special and really is the the most important single factor in the identity of the university yeah i agree with you i mean you can have a university without administrators because faculty will they'll do that for themselves you can have a university without students because faculty are students that's what we are we're like lifetime learners as an all souls oxford yeah and and you know teach each other and teach ourselves and stuff i do think that if you want to improve a university i would say that the key factor there is to is to improve the quality of your students i think that's that's maybe the bottom line and then other things will they'll sort of push other things to fall into place or you'll fail um do you feel we've done that over the last few years yeah yeah i think that although you know i was thinking about that i had students the first year i was here who were very very bright just as good as the best students that i've had any other year but but i think there's a higher percentage of those better students now but at any rate the so the, the faculty has not been valued and has not played a role in it what was your question i forget the the, the role of faculty well, yeah, in decision faculty, making what, yeah, I'm, yeah, what i'm really yeah. getting at is uh i guess a little more current uh in terms of topics we've talked about and that is that there now is a great passion on the part of many of our former colleagues to try to move more in the direction of what we would call a faculty senate. Yeah. The view being that the faculty has really never really been able to speak with one voice here, which I haven't agreed with, uh, that by having a university senate system, that kind of uh, entity dilutes the voice because you've got people like the president and the provost and a few deans and a bunch of students in it and you don't have a faculty senate. Now there seems to be a move in the direction of, oh, after all these many years of not having a chance to speak with a voice, that now we're going to have a faculty senate. I guess I'm really asking if you think that that has been a problem in the governance system in the years that you've been. Well, I, I will say, just for the record, in case nobody else has mentioned this, that in, in our early years here, um, junior faculty members were not allowed to serve in the, in the faculty senate. Right. But it, it, Joe Trimmer, in, in the department meeting during that first year here, Joe Trimmer and Bruce Kirkham made the mistake of speaking up in a meeting. 
And, and we were told in no uncertain terms, junior faculty members are to be seen and not heard. I mean, that was the case in the English department. And then, and then, uh, and then furthermore, in the university as a whole, you couldn't, couldn't even serve in the university right. senate. Right. Yeah, and, and my sense, and, and I could be totally wrong about this, but my sense of the university senate was that it was such a colossal waste of time that I would not include that in my career. Okay. So I just, I never, I was never involved in, okay. in the university senate. Okay. Um, and now I know changes are taking place, mm -hmm. but um, really beginning when, when I had my, my arterial problems, et cetera, and, and the, the operation, et cetera, okay. I, I really sort of began to, to lose touch with that dimension of what's been going on at the university. So, so I've heard that these things are happening and they yeah. sound like good things to me, but I, I just haven't been involved in it. You touched on this a little bit before, but I'd like you to reflect as kind of a final category on the relationship during the time you've been here of the town and the gown. I mean, do you think it's any better now than it was when you first came? I mean, you, you, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but you did use this word now as you get this kind of retrograde city administration. Uh, so I, we, we hear so much about Ball State doesn't do enough for the community. And I happen to disagree with that. I think Ball State does an awful lot for the community that one never hears about. Sure. Uh, so I'd just like to get your perspective on the town gown relationship. Because I moved out of town. So yeah. <laughs> I, that's right. I mean, I lived right downtown yeah. for a while and then moved out <laughs> into the country. Right. Um, <laughs> oh, it's a problem everywhere. Okay. Uh, you know, isn't it? I, I mean, it's, that's what I hear. Yeah. And it's probably still a problem here, although my sense of it personally, w w within the arts, and I'm involved somewhat yeah. because of Nina as, as a painter, sure. she's an art, so I'm involved in that. Yeah. Um, from that point of view, I think the town town situation is much better than that was. It's certainly, my experience there is more positive now than it was back when we tried to do the Delaware County Council of the Arts. Um, well, the art people, I think, are involved a lot with the, the town because the gallery yeah, space. Yeah, with the, the sort of renewal or restoration yeah, of, right. or whatever of the, of the downtown. I, I probably just don't know a whole lot. About okay, that. so you, you wouldn't say that it's changed over time, uh, except from the perspective yeah. of the revival of downtown and the role of people like your wife, who was, of I, course, a I professor feel of art. Though, I feel as though possibly there's less prejudice going both directions, less prejudice on the part of faculty whom, whom I talk with, okay. prejudice against the, the, the town, and less prejudice on the part of people town that I meet against faculty members. Okay. So, yeah. but that, that's just one person's very impressionistic sense of it. Anything else you'd like to add? Any other reflections on anything pertaining to truly what I think was a long and distinguished career as a member of the, yeah, of the have, English faculty? I had a good time. Yeah. So it was a good career. I, I do think that the university um, provided a lot of opportunities for Plenty of opportunities to teach well, and, you know, and which was which I found very satisfying. I mean, aside from whether I did teach well or not, I, I found the attempt to be to be very satisfying, mm -hmm. and um, and and also a lot of support in, in terms of uh, creative arts grants and uh, assigned time of various kinds, everything but salary. You know, everything but salary, and, and, and always except salary. This university turned out to be uh, a very good place. Um, I do think the university is a better institution of higher learning today than it was when we came. Yeah, in a lot of ways, significantly stronger. I guess it's really, though, looking at it as you do and I do from the standpoint of, gee, there are also a lot of ways where it's been very good, but it could have been far better. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Salary only being one example. Yeah, no, sure. <laughs> yeah. sure. Opportunities, we, you know. But, but when we did the super course thing. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, so I, some of these people who have been very influential in my life stayed at GW. Yeah. 
one of whom was the, was the brother of, of the vice president of the United States. Of, of not, Mondale wasn't vice president then, but he was a, an important senator and then became vice president. I mean, I had that kind of connection. Sir. At that moment, I could have brought big dollars to this university. And the people in the higher administration could not see that. I mean, they, they just, they couldn't imagine it. They literally could not imagine it. And, and took some actions that, that simply eliminated that opportunity. Um, I think there were other opportunities, there have been other opportunities, not just for me, but, but you know, probably maybe you and, yeah. and other people, uh, in which we could, have, we could have taken some real significant steps in the university had we had the kind of, of support that, that maybe we would have gotten other places, maybe not, but at any rate, we didn't get it here. I'll tell you a silly example very quickly. When we got what was then the largest grant balls they ever received, three plus million for the Midtown Hill project, in the late 70s, that project ended uh, being part of a corporation that Peter D. Davis ultimately set up in New York City because our business affairs people could not come up with a way to, within a calendar week, pay the people that were coming in here to shoot the film and to take the sound and things like that because we didn't do it that way. So when Jim Pyle came here as research director and discovered that Ball State had received nothing out of a $3.4 million grant, as I said, the largest we could see up to that point, he was just appalled that we couldn't figure out a way to do that. Well, now, obviously, they could figure out a way to do it, but he wasn't any more appalled than we were, Joe Trimmer, Dwight Hoover, and myself, that we couldn't get a business office to write checks and to turn them around and pay these people. And Davis said, that's intolerable. I'm taking the whole grant from the National Endowment for Humanities and Xerox Corporation, and I'm going to set up a corporation in Midtown Manhattan. Thank you very much. So I mean, I, you're right. I mean, I yeah. use that as an example. Okay, my, my story is uh, Pete Mondale, who was my colleague there, during the first several years I was here, he got a million dollars from from the National Endowment for the Humanities right. to do a thing similar to Superbus, so a, a little bit different yeah. there, similar thing um, at GW. So then I brought him here as, as an outside consultant. Yeah. Yeah. He came in in the spring, talked with our students, our faculty, and our administrators. And, and as he left at the airport, he said, okay, you've got fine students, you've got fine faculty, your administrators are just yeah. very, very weak. Well, that was and sure true. enough, the yeah. administrators decide, I mean, I, I, I could have, you know, if they had gone the other way, I could have gone to Pete and said, okay, right. we're ready, get us a million bucks. Right. You know, we, we'd have had that. Yeah. The three years, three year project. Right. Yeah. Well, we don't, but the, as I said, I, I agree with you completely because in our case, we got the money, largely because Davis was involved with the project. We just couldn't figure out a way to spend it, <laughs> at least in an expeditious <laughs> way. Yeah. Right, right. Anything else you want to add? Oh, that's pretty good. Thank you very I much. I remember something in the car. <laughs> on the way home, but that'll do it for history, in terms of my participation in history. Well, I appreciate you participating <laughs> in my project.